Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Real people doing real deals in real estate and no fake gurus allowed. We bring you the best and the most real real estate investors in the space. They'll be showing you the good, the bad, and the ugly of real estate investing. Like, share, subscribe, get notified. It's the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Welcome to the Real Estate Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of bringing a couple of my friends from the Houston, Texas. These guys are killing it in locally in the area and, and Texas as well. Uh, we were just having a little conversation prior to getting started. Kirk and Lee, man, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, this this is long overdue, man. I remember the first time I asked you guys to come, you guys like, well, I don't know if we're ready for that yet. <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean, dude? I just want, you just got to come and tell your story. That's it, you know? But anyhow, who wants to start first, man? Who is Kirk or who is Lee? Yeah, so, yeah, man. And first of all, I just want to say, man, thank you for, for having us on here. We always like to start off with gratitude, even with our sales team. Awesome. I don't think sometimes people give you enough gratitude for what yeah. you do, man. You've helped us out so much, uh, opening up your network to us and inviting us here to be with you guys here on this podcast. So we just want to first start off by saying, my pleasure. I want to thank you guys for being on the RE3 Mastermind coming up in Miami, Florida. I got the yachts yesterday. Dude. Ooh, that's going to be fun, dude. Excited, babe. Excited. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be fun. Yeah, so just uh, just to get started, uh, a little bit about me. Um, born and raised in, in California. So I've lived in California. I've lived in Portland, Oregon. I've lived in Seattle, Washington, Dallas. And then I came to Houston for college. So. Man, just to stop you there, I was just texting Oregon, Salem, uh all those little towns, because I don't go for the big city. I don't go for Portland itself. I go for, like, all the – so just to give you an example, and that's already – you're already familiar with those areas. Anyways, keep going, man. So too young, too young during that time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. Pacific Northwest is so beautiful. Man. It is beautiful. So beautiful. So I've uh, been in Houston. I uh, met this guy in college, uh, you know, U of H. I met this guy in college, and we went off and did our, our separate thing in uh, corporate America. And, you know, we decided, hey, we've, we've got to figure out something different, right? Have a little bit more control of our destiny. Right. And not putting into the hands of you don't know who, right? Right. Who's making those ultimate decisions in corporate America? Yeah. They give you an idea of who's doing it or how you get promoted, but, you, you know, there's a decision made somewhere else, right? So we just had that conversation. And, you know, you can't do business with everybody, right? Yeah. You wish you could do business with all your friends, but – you know, Kirk and I, we matched very well. We always had really good conversations, and uh, we just landed in, in real estate. One of our friends at the time was actually Kirk's friend. Uh, he was telling us about real estate, told us about a little thing called wholesaling. Who was that? Was. What's his name? Uh, his name is B. Show, Brandon Show. So what's up, Brandon? Shout out to Brandon. Yeah, he's killing it, man. He's, he's on multiple, uh, you know, uh, service as service as a software provider. So okay. a lot of that. He's living in, what, Colombia now or Costa Rica? So he's living the dream. So Oh, wow. Good deal. Good for him. Absolutely. So what about you, Kirk? So for me, uh, I was born and raised here, uh, Missouri City, Texas. Um, like Lee said, uh, we met in college. You know, I, I didn't leave. You know, most people, they go to college, they go different state, have fun. But, you know, for me, I'm a hometown guy. So I stayed home, went to U of H, met this guy, um, left U of H, started corporate America. And you know how corporate it is. You come yep. From that world. I was there. Uh, fun for, for a little while, but for long term, it's, it's not. You know. I, man, I had the, the golden handcuffs. So my last two years in corporate or a year and a half, I didn't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. But the only reason I was there was because of the salary. Absolutely. You know, and you know how they say all the time, a salary is the money they pay you to uh, to keep you like at a certain level or whatever. I can't remember exactly the, the quote that I've, I've read on social media somewhere, but it was true. I mean, I have built my life around a salary. So, you know, I made good money. I have built a very expensive lifestyle because you made money for a while and you create your own rat race, right? And how, you know, even though I hated it at the, at the, at the end, 
I, I couldn't leave or I didn't want to leave because I didn't know there was any better out there, right? Um, so you were making too much money. You were making more than we were. So Yeah, I was <laughs> I was making two sixty a year. Exactly. Uh that and and by the way, I didn't have to clock in or out. They didn't even know if I was in the office. My bo- my my last boss in that company was in Aberdeen, Sco- uh, Scotland. So, you know, he's seven hours ahead of me. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I was, I was. That's how I got fat. You know, they, they I was eating in great restaurants every day and traveling a lot. But, but I wasn't happy and fulfilled with what I was doing at the end um, because of the same politics. You know, uh, backstabbings and things of that nature. So when they laid me off. I went and started doing real estate. And I mean, I, I had already been doing real estate, but it was more of a passive thing. Right. I was on the side. You know, it was extra money for me. I had to go figure out how to make a living out of it. Um, so so you guys landed in real estate. You found wholesaling, right? That's right. That's right. Found and and how, who, how do you guys, like, how do you get educated? Like, what was the process like? Uh, a lot of books, right? A lot of books. YouTube University. Yeah, uh, we start off on live, and that's what we uh, pride ourselves on starting off. Right. Sometimes we see a lot of people that come into the game and just get started. I know it's take action, but I think sometimes take action without doing any type of due diligence, doing some homework to kind of figure yeah, out. Yeah, there's you know, stupidity, you know, right? Like it's you're it's just it. gonna go throw money away right. unless you get lucky. Exactly. Exactly. And those are the ones who give. I think wholesalers who really treat this business like a business, it gives us a kind of a bad rap, but it also allows us to separate ourselves from those people. Yeah. Right. And then we're providing that type of service. And sometimes you can hear, you can hear in people's voices, their expertise that they, they know what they're doing and they have that confidence to be able to perform. Right. So, right. You know, so we just read a lot of books, YouTube university, um, our friend who uh, Kirk got us connected with uh, Brandon, he gave us a little bit more information, some things that we needed to do. And then we also did, uh, you know, one of those programs you go to, you go to the, uh, the, meet the up, seminar, the seminar, the weekend seminar for you know three hundred bucks, and then they upsell you. Okay, now do the bus tour, and then you go to the bus tour, and then they upsell you for the next thing. And um, you know, we uh, it was one that was in town, and uh, you know, Kirk at the time I had already I had already quit my job full time before we did that. I quit in June, and this was in August, and uh, you know, I'd gotten out of debt. I did that before you know I went full time, so that was the right. thing that I had did too. And Kirk was convinced me, hey man, let's put these on the credit card. So, you know, we put some money on it. It was like ten grand that we split. That's not page. bad. Yeah, not bad. Um, and thankfully, one of the guys who was there at the, the 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 real estate training event, he told us, he pulled us to the side and said, listen, you know, I know you guys don't need the fifty thousand dollar level, the thirty thousand dollar level, the ten thousand. That's the base level. He said because right. you guys, you know, I see it in you. Like you guys are, you, you guys, the way you talk, how you guys are hungry you've, you've done the work you've studied the business he said i promise you if you do this and you learn about it you guys will eventually get here anyway so right it's just i guess going from that ten thousand to fifty thousand dollar level is really about how much hand holding do you want and yes we, we really need that. yeah Absolutely. yeah that's what most of my friends that sell those kind of packages yeah. do mm-hmm. fifty thousand dollar packages call me on my cell phone i'm gonna hold you i'm gonna look at offers with you or whatever yeah. so and so this, this, what year is this? 2017. Yeah, 2017. 2017. 2017. Wow. 2017. So. Harvey year. So the, yeah, I remember <laughs> that one very well. So 2017, I guess I bumped into you at the 713, but I never saw Kirk. It was just you. Yeah, well, I think when we probably bumped into each other, that pro- it had to have been, I, I don't even think it was probably even that year. I think it was probably the following year. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. 2018, yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah, um, and how was your first deal? Like, how do you get your first deal? First deal. So we started February of 2017. We studied for probably I want to say four or five months. Started marketing July, August. Harvey hit. So from February to August, you know, we were out there. We did our first direct mail marketing because that's what everybody was saying. Right. That's all I did at the time, too. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we did it, and we sent out maybe... Over a 1,000. Yeah, it's like 1,500 pieces. <laughs> got no calls. Yeah. Of course, the, the spirit, <laughs> it, it dipped really quick. It crushes you, yeah, man. It crushes you, you know, especially for us, because we started off with literally nothing. Uh, I put $1,000 into it. He put $1,000 starting. So we didn't have much marketing dollars, right? So 
that first direct mail marketing campaign literally took about 800 bucks. So, you know, you do the math, we're like, all right, we can't do that again, right? So we started figuring out different ways that we can actually, you know, use our time, be more proactive, started door knocking. Uh, door knocked for a while, didn't get any deals from it. Then we started banded signs. So we started banded signs in August, and then Harvey happened. And that actually, I hate to say it, but it helped us. Yeah. It helped us out. I know it was bad for a lot of people, but for us, it, it leveled the playing field. Um, in Houston at that time, there were a lot of big players. It, yeah. was, it was hard to move. It yeah. was hard to move. But uh, once that happened, no one knew what, what prices would be like, what, if they would ever bounce back, you know, the home values. Yeah. You know, they, never, they didn't know what repair costs looked like, so everybody was learning. So at that point, level playing field, now we're just like, okay, let's figure out these new numbers and let's just jump on it. And first deal came from a bandit sign, flooded house, lady called us, Lee took that call. Um, and uh, yeah, we went out to her house, first, very first appointment, spent four hours with her. Uh, and she was, didn't talk anything about the house. It's all about her, yeah. um, you know, her family. Creating her report. Report, yeah. that's right. And she was like, you know, all right, what are you offering? At the very end, Gave her a number, and um, she was like, wow, that's way off from what I was expecting. So I think we did the numbers close, right? Yeah, we did numbers close. Numbers yeah. close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we offered her something like, it was like 88000 Uh She was looking for 140 at the time. And what was the ARV? Uh, at the time, we, we assumed that the ARV was about 185 Yeah, so. Yeah, so, right. It, and so. Even 88 was a little high. It, it was. Yeah. It was. But, but they took really good care of that they property. Did. It was, and yeah. they had already started rehabbing. She okay. Had 40 grand into it. Oh, wow. Rehabbing. Okay. Right. So she said she had left over another 40. So we just used her rehab numbers and said, okay. You know, and did, did the numbers close, came up with our offer. Um, but it was low, of course. But she said, I like you guys. So I want you to meet my husband. Come back tomorrow. And we did that. And the next day, we spent four hours with him and built that rapport. And at that point, even though the number was low, he didn't want to work with anyone else. She had already talked to four other people. She was saying that they were rude, they were impatient, they were pushy. Yeah. And she was like, you know, I really like you guys. Let's figure something out. And we, we worked something out. And, uh, yeah, we ended up locking that one up for $92,000. Yep. Um, so they came down from one forty. Yep, to ninety two. <laughs> and it turns out, so, of course, like we said, no one really knew ARVs at the time. Right. ARV actually <coughs> ended up being like two ten. Yeah. So, you know, we were able to sell it for a good amount and make a good good profit on it. That's good. Do you guys uh, flip that one or, or do you wholesale it? We signed it. Because you guys do both today, right? You you flip, you wholesale, you wholesale too. Yeah, that's correct. Right? So. And shout out to uh, Andy and Andre if they're watching. Uh, yeah. yeah so. Those are my great friends, man. I haven't seen them in a while. Yeah. Uh, actually, last the last one I saw was Andre at our mastermind. Uh, I haven't seen Andy in quite a while. Yeah, so anybody who talks to us, you know, we always like to give those guys props, right? When we start off in this business um, with that real estate education company, uh, these were some of the guys who were hired on to actually educate some of those other levels. Yeah. So they were like the liaison, um, and they were always doing the, the coaching calls and stuff. And we couldn't afford the class. We weren't in that level, the, right. the classes they were teaching, right, because we were just in the $10,000 level, right? Right. But, um, uh, they, they, saw, they saw our hunger. And uh, they just like, hey, how can we help you, right? And so our first two deals, we actually did JVs with them. And that's so, awesome. Um, that's what just really opened our eyes in this business about, you know, having 100% of a grape or 10% of a watermelon. Yep. Uh, because I think initially when we were running our numbers, we were thinking, oh, man, I think we could make 10 grand on it, right? Um, but when we brought it to them uh, to dispo the deal, it ended up turning into a $40,000 deal. Wow. So a $40,000 deal that we split. And so we made double, even splitting it, right, and just JVing it. And we, man, man we can make this much. I, I tell like, people all the time. I, I ran into a friend of mine here, and he was he came to me and said, Ricardo, man, I made twenty thousand on this deal, and I was like, really good for you, man. Well, tell me about the deal. Yeah. It was X amount of units, and when he said that, I said, what, twenty? Bro, <laughs> you left like 80 on the table. And he's like, no way. And I said, yes, you did, man. Let me show you. And I showed him. I said, I could have sold this thing for $80,000 more than what you sold it for. Absolutely. But you didn't want to share the deal with me, you know. And and 
and us that been around a little longer now, you know, we got we know what the buyers are looking for. We know what they're willing to pay, and we can squeeze, you know, like those guys did at the time, an extra thirty k. Because on your book, it's like I'll make ten k and I'm good. Well, how about you guys make twenty? We make twenty. Done deal. I've done deals with them too. So Absolutely. it's been a long time, but um, solid guys. Yeah, they're great guys. Yeah. Uh, they're my. They're they're our friends here as well. So, um, you know. Most of us around Houston know who we all are, right? Um, it's just that the COVID thing, man, they just put everything to to rest. And um, I lost track of a lot of people. And the networking events are, are not the same. And a lot of people are afraid still to go out and, you know, be in a place where there's a hundred more people in there. And you know there's COVID in there. So, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Yeah. All right. So you guys did your first deal. You split it with those guys. Awesome. You got paid. How do you? How did it go from there? Like, what was the process for you guys to continue to grow? So from there, uh, first deal with them. That was that ended up closing in November 2017. Uh, our next deal came the following year. So it was about January, February 2018. Same thing. Lock it up. Brought it to them because at the time we didn't. We weren't focusing on buyers. It was like, hey, yeah, for you. I, I, I tell all the new wholesalers, focus on getting contracts. Yep. Find somebody that you can dispo deals with. 100%. That way you can keep your pipeline full, yep. and and you both share the the pie. You know, so so you were doing that. That's what we were doing, right? And you, you, you really have to prepare that crap up front because without the contracts, you can't do anything anyway, right? One hundred percent. You know, we we prepared the taxes. You told me the acquisitions, right? We um, we did that, and then we said, okay. How much longer can we do this, right? We, if we really want to make this a business and really want to grow, we have to we have to learn the other side as well, yeah. right? So that's when we started dispoing ourselves. So we started building that buyers list, um, so reaching out to to investors, going to a lot of networking events, talking to people, mm -hmm. right? So yep. uh, we started doing that, started building that list, and then the third deal came, and um, it was a big deal, uh, and we we took that one all the way home ourselves, right? So at that point, we realize, okay, we're on to something here, right? We can actually build some. We can actually build a real company. You know, most of the times when people start wholesaling, they think of it as just like, oh, I'm going to get this one deal here, go spend the money, and get this one deal here, go spend the money. That's what most of them do. Yeah, you're always starting from zero, right? But for us, we, we, we took that mindset from, from of course, corporate backgrounds and, uh, you know, accounting majors. We are like, okay. Let's start really saving some of this money and allocating it correctly, right, in order to scale. So once that big deal hit, of course, we took, I think we took maybe 25% of that and put it directly to marketing. That's, that's the way to do it. Once that hit, that's when we started flowing. We started flowing at that point, and uh, that's all she wrote, man. So we wholesaled all of 2018, and then 2019 is when we started kind of venturing out towards, you know, fix and flips. Um, of course, more host, more wholesales, and then hoteling. Hoteling really, really jumped on for us in 2019. That's awesome, man. And you know, you were saying something about um, running a real business. I tell most people that get in this business, I said, "Look, you can make a living wholesaling. Yeah, you can make ten grand a month. But how much of that ten grand are you going to put back into marketing?" How much are you going to put back into systems? And before you know it, you're not really making 10. You're making five. Absolutely. And now if you're doing mailers, you're, <laughs> you're probably <laughs> making a lot less, <laughs> right? Because right? the cost per acquisition on a mailer is very high. Absolutely. And it takes different multiple touches to, to, to get the person. But, you know, I come myself coming from a corporate America background too, I, I had to uh, scale it quickly. I was like, man, I can't be doing this. Because I was the acquisitions guy, the closer. But I was also the closer for the dispo. Dennis, at the time, he will fit in between both. Like, gotcha. he would be the guy answering the phone. But when it was time to close the deal, he'll toss it over to me, and then I'll close the deal. Gotcha. Then when it was time to sell the property, he will go and buy, find buyers. But then I will be the guy selling the property. Like, so he was in between. Like I was on, like, <laughs> I was like a, like a closer, That's but, right, but right. he was the guy doing most of that work. And at some point, I said, dude, we got to hire some people, man, because this is a lot of freaking work. Uh, and I remember the first time we had 10 properties on our contract, 
I could not believe it that I had like almost $150,000 in assignments in there. And I said, man, this shit is real. Like you can literally make all this money in wholesaling. Um, Cause I knew how to ma- do that on flipping. You do three or four good flips and that's it. That's you make that much revenue that month. Uh, if you're flipping constantly. Right. But one thing is I didn't want to flip anymore because of what happened after Harvey, I got my ass handed back ass, you know, back to me and, you know, lost a lot of money, lost properties, got properties foreclosed on all that stuff. So I was like, okay, if, if you can do this on wholesaling, now we just got to scale it. But people think scaling is easy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. so tell me, man, about your journey on your scaling. Like, how many teams have you guys had now? <laughs> uh, so we're actually on our, what, our, th- our third team now. Okay. And, and obviously we, I think because of our accounting backgrounds, we've always been somewhat kind of like risk averse and more patient with taking yeah. action. Because uh, there's a difference between working in corporate America and, and doing a great job there and then being able to do a great job as an entrepreneur. Right. I mean, they're just two completely different worlds. So yeah. it took, it's taken us some time to, like, really develop as, like, true entrepreneurs and really just more so of, like, just really taking massive action, right? And so with our teams, we were being too patient in terms of, like, oh, it's going to take them some time to – to grow and to get deals and just being too patient, right? Yeah. Like we we hired slow and then we also fired slow. Yeah. Right. And then uh, with the new guys we've hired now, um, we 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 hired slow, but we have expectations in terms of hey, this is what we need to be hitting. And the the thing is, this is their first month, so we we're just starting with the new team that we have right. now. Uh, but we we learned, and that's the good thing about this is a journey, right? And everybody thinks this is a th- you know get rich quick thing, but there's so many things that you have to learn just by doing that. Unfortunately, you're not going to learn in YouTube. You're not going to learn in the books. Like, yes, in theory, you understand it. You can read about it. You can hear about it. Yeah. But until you go through it, it's, that's a whole different animal. 100%. 100%. So you're on your third team now. Yeah. I think I'm on my – I lost count, dude. Like, <laughs> but that's yeah. the thing, right? So you guys are the drivers behind your business. Right. Whether it's today's team or tomorrow's team, you're always going to have a team. You're going to figure out how to get more butts in the seats and people to, you know. Uh, what I've learned is that uh, I focus now on A players only. Absolutely. I only want A players. And these guys are all A players. I don't, I, I don't have that many. But you don't need a lot. Yeah. But I don't need a lot of A players, right. Right? That's right? And the guys in Miami as well, they're A players. These guys are killers. So I don't need 50 acquisitions guys to do a bunch of transactions. Those two guys, they handle everything. So uh, now I'm focusing more on getting more A players, making sure they get paid. Mm-hmm. That's very, that's key. Now, we are commissions only. You guys are a mix. Yes. So I don't do the base salary because I keep them hungry that way. Mm-hmm. But some of these guys, they're hitting $10,000 a month already. And, you know, they're coming from under a third month. Absolutely. And they're like, shit. I can't believe I can make this much money, you know, on whole, you know, being at dispositions or an acquisitions guy. And then they don't have to pay for rent. They don't have to pay for the systems. They don't have to buy the data, um, which is, you know, and you asked me earlier before the, the podcast, you know, why I had acquisitions, dispositions separate. Right. Right. Well, so what was happening to me was when I had like, not on the last team because the last team was a very talented team. Um, and shout out to Junior and Jesse and all those guys. Uh, they just they just didn't fit our culture. You know, they, they had their own culture. So they were wholesalers. So kind of like a bunch of wholesalers coming together. That is, it's tough, yeah. right? So, yeah, it's a bunch of entrepreneurs. So they're going to come in when they want to come in. They're going to leave when they want to leave. Right. And then I had a mixture of guys that were on salary that were coming in full time. And that was... There was it was creating conflicts, and you know eventually they ended up leaving on their own, and 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 then I had this new team together, but they were not as hungry because they were on that they knew that Friday they were gonna collect those five hundred bucks or whatever, right? So eventually those guys left too, and I was it was just me and Shane. But I'm so good at attracting people that very quickly I had three more people, actually two of them. I met them at that event that Q uh, we did in your office. Oh, really? Yes, sir. That's awesome. They're here. That's awesome. So, uh, Caxi and Sangster. Okay. 
And Sangster is one of those guys. Since that event, he, he came right right away the next week, and now he's he's freaking, he's a kid or selling houses. Um, but that's all they do. And then we set the expectations from day one. We say, look, you're going to come here to sell houses only. Yes, I will teach you about lead generation, but that will be later on. Because I do want them to, to grow their own, get their own deals. Because that's cherry on the top. Absolutely. If they get their, bring their own deals, they got their own marketing dollars, their own systems. But now what I found out is that I have actually three different operations. So I have the lead generation operation. I have an acquisitions operation, and I have a dispositions operation. And they're all real good in what they do on their own. So they just focus on that craft, on that being experts at that, right? I thought I had shut that down. Um, and not a single member of the three teams knows the whole process, which was happening to me. I was training a lot of people for free. They will come in, they learn how to lead generate, they learn how to call, they learn how to lock them up, they learn how to sell them. And eventually, they're like, huh, I don't need to do this for Ricardo with Ricardo anymore. I'm thinking it's easy, yeah. Yeah, well, it gets easier for them. Right. Because at the beginning, the unknown is, I don't know how to do this. But then you teach them the whole process, they're like, oh, I got it figured out. I'll just go make the $10,000 on my own. That's right. And then they go on their own, and, and they're like, ah, oh, I didn't realize I got to put money into this, right? So... <laughs> And I talked to I one of them that these are free. <laughs> yeah, I talked to one of them that left, and he's like, "Man, I'm struggling right now." I was like, "Bro, I told you. I mean, you know, I know how to deal with the struggle, but it's like you guys. I put thirty percent back into marketing. No questions asked. The more data I buy, the better we do. So, um, so let's talk about teams. How do you guys have your team set up? Like, you got acquisitions, transactional, like." Absolutely. So a lot of the stuff we actually do in-house, right? So we really, we have just really good title companies that we have relationships right. with. And the thing is, I know a lot of people that you talk to, that, you know, a lot of them are nationwide. Yeah. We've been local for, you know, for years, right? So yeah. We're, we've opened up Dallas earlier this year. So we're in Houston, Dallas, and we're opening up in San Antonio as well. So yeah. we're Texas, right? So right. the good thing about that is the pros and cons, right? The, the con to that is you can only scale so much when you're only in one market, which we talked about before the podcast. Yeah. Right? Uh, but the pros is that you, you've you kind of vetted out a lot of the people who you're working with in your own market, right? right? So we've vetted out other title companies. So we've got main title companies that we work with, right? So for us, uh, doing TC work is very simple. It's not a lot. It, it, it's Once you understand it, it's not that much, it's right? Just, and, and it's not like we're doing 30 deals. The only thing you're, cha you're chasing is heirs that need to sign some paperwork and yeah. things of that nature. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's not really like you're not going to clean – a lien on the property that that's right. easy, you know? Right. So go ahead. Yeah. So uh, we lean on the title company a lot for the TC work. Uh, we'll do TC as needed doing the paperwork. Uh, so how we have it divided just as partners, right? So Kirk is over dispo. Okay. So we like to divide and conquer. We tell our people, so we don't have two Kings in the same castle. And I think it's kind of similar how you and Shane have it too, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So you guys are just alpha, alpha men and it's easy to clash when you guys are focused on the same thing. So it's best. Hey, this is your part of the business. You Actually, own. honestly, Shane runs the whole thing, man. Uh, okay. Yeah, he 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 runs dispos and acquisitions. Gotcha. Um, I I'm over Shane, but I don't tell Shane what to do. You know, he knows what needs to happen. Uh, but his main core, because he's the COO, and his main core is training, which he's freaking phenomenal at. And because he comes from the car industry, so he used to have a big dealership, so he knows how to train people and, you know, uh, and training and then title work. That's like once we open title, he's the one who opens that. So he's kind of like the TC. Yeah. Um, but in reality, like you were saying, you got good title companies that do the TC work. Then all you're doing is babysitting them, right. making sure it's getting done. Uh, if they need your help, then they'll tell you, "Hey, I need your I need your help." What? Okay, perfect. What do we need? Okay, we need to go get a signature or. or and you get a payoff from the IRS or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, so that's what he focuses on. But you guys, but your focus is still divided, right? So even though he might be doing sales and act, what is your main focus? So my main focus is completely different today. Right. My main focus is to like do this, yeah. go out and network uh, the events, uh, you know, and and build relationships. That's my I'm a relationships guy. 
Yeah, so so yeah. that's that's where I've been focusing. And I'll tell you right now, I had this great idea uh, just this Friday. Uh, I went to Dallas to an event uh, that was there. A shout out to the All of Eight Entrepreneurs. Uh, they did they did a pretty good job. Yeah, uh, and as soon as I get on stage, I get off stage after my my talk. You just get bombarded. People start coming to you. Hey, you know, let's 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 talk, right? We probably got 10 contracts that day. And I'm thinking, man, how much did that actually cost me? How much would it cost you to do cold calling for all these things? Right. And then I said, I'm going to do a tour. Like, I'm just going to go on tour. Like like rock bands and shit, like rappers, you know? <laughs> I'm just going to go on tour city to city, <laughs> throwing events, you know? and Because cause you're, you're, if you start serving the local guys, it comes back, it, it comes back around. You know, teach them, show them how to lead generate, uh, which is something I'm very good at in, on the lead generation. Uh, I do oversee that. You know, like I manage a lot of the VAs um, in Venezuela that do all of our texting and and all of that, all of, all of that other stuff. But that's my focus. My focus is to build relationships, and the only way I'm able to do that is because I got a guy like Shane, and then I got a guy like Caesar that Caesar runs the dispos. And then I got a guy like my brother in Miami and, and, and Eddie, who are the acquisitions. They're on their own. I don't have to tell them to be at the office at 9 o'clock in the morning. Right. I don't. Like, they're there, you know. And so they're, they're self-motivated, um, but they're disciplined as well. That's hard to find. Very much so. so, you know, the way I hire, I don't know how you guys hire, but – I used to do all these ads and stuff, man. I got tired of that. And now I just hire from people that know of us and they, they approach us and they were like, yeah, come on in. We'll interview you. We'll see if you're a fit because we want to make sure the core values are there. Uh, we already had too many people that core values weren't aligned. And, yeah, they're great people. They're talented. But if the core values are not aligned, there's always going to be a, a, you know, a, a clash, a, a disconnect. So we focus more on that now. So now we do fire fast. If I see somebody that in a, in like in a week and they, they're not pumping out the numbers on KPIs on how many calls they made and how many contacts, and I was like, but buddy, this is not going to work for you because I'd rather not waste their time. Yeah. You know, They're wasting our times as well. So, um, so anyway, acquisitions, dispos, then transactionals are title companies. Title companies. So if it's on the dispo side, he'll handle the TC on the dispo side. Got it. So we'll split it like that. Great. I, that, I used to run it like that, by the way. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation because people who are watching this, right, they could see progression, right? Because now you've already gone through that stage and now you're at a position to where you can just network and build your brand and yeah. all that, which is the goal for us, right? Yeah. But you can only do that once you have the team in place and everybody, all the A players are where they need to be at so that you can go off and do those things. A hundred percent. That's what we're currently working on so that we can definitely – yeah, because that takes leaders. Like right. you really have to have leaders within your organization. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for leaders yeah. all the time. And that's what you have. You know, you have Shane. Shane's a leader. Yeah. Right. You know, um, your brother out in Miami. Yeah. They're leaders. So once you have those type of people in your organization, that's when you can then start, you know, building underneath them, and they can manage that. They can manage your your whole operations, and you can go out and do what you need to do. And do have fun and go do these that's events it. and network and, be on and yachts. <laughs> be on yachts and meet other people, you know, and, and, and the more hands you shake, the more money you make. I, I, I like, I, it, it's a true testament. Like, I'll give you an example. A shout out to the All In guys in Phoenix, Arizona. I've been through their events, uh, All In and Freedom, uh, both of them. And I pay for my ticket, you know, like, I'm not kind of, hey, can you hook me up with a free ticket and shit? No, no, no. I pay for my VIP ticket. Why do I want to pay for a VIP ticket? Because I want to hang out with the VIP guys. Right. I've made of their events more than six figures with a little $1,500 ticket that I paid the first time, and the second one was like $2,000, $2,500, something like that. And why is that? Because I went there, I started networking, getting to know people. Hey, we can help each other out this way, and next thing you know, they're JVing with me, or some of them are actually my mentees now. I'm showing them how to scale uh, their businesses to where they can do all, uh, what we do today. And um, – I just want to. I just. I just gotta get myself in as many circles as I can. Your network is your net worth. Your network is your net worth. So, 
So let's talk about your process for, because this is about you guys, not about me. Let's talk about the process uh, on on your three different strategies that you most use. Are you guys accumulating rentals right now or not? Not really. We That's actually, weird because you guys are accountants, man. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, so the, the rentals, we actually unloaded the rentals, and uh, we only have one left, and we're actually converting those to just creative finance. We just yeah. want to do notes, keep yeah. it simple. We don't want to deal with the tenants, toilets, and trash. We don't want to deal with I'm that guy, too. Yeah. yeah, so just make our lives easier. I mean, yes, you can get uh, the equity play. Yes, you can get depreciation with a rental, but then you just like no especially you guys are running a, a wholesaling wholesaling fix and flip business it, it, it takes a lot man to do three of those you know um i i don't flip anymore i, I just wholesale here we don't wholesale either we literally every deal for us has got to be a wholesale deal um now we're kind of learning about innovations with Corey, but um because we I realized that if we narrow focus all of our energy on that one trick, we're going to be real good at it. And now we can grow to having our goal here is to have 100 contracts per month. Uh, and, you know, you have a contract, 100 contracts per month, you're closing maybe on 20 or 30 of them. Absolutely. And then some of them will trickle down That's to right. the following months and all that. I hear people say, all the time, I do 40 deals a month. I say, I want to see 40 huts, buddy. Right. I want to see what that looks like. Uh, and I, trust me, there's people out there doing it. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, but uh, there's not that many of them. <laughs> yes. Put it to you that way. So, so how do you guys decide what's a wholesale, what's a flip, and what's a wholesale? Uh, honestly, and I'll let Kirk add to this as well. Um, we just have it, We just keep it very simple, right? Uh, you know, when I look at it, I look at deals like a like a like a baseball field, right? You've got your singles, doubles, triples, your home runs, then of course you got your grand slam deals, right? And so typically we will not do a flip if if it's if it's if the repair budget is in excess of thirty thousand, we'll let it go. Got it. Uh, we've done the sixty thousand dollar remodels. We've done that. It's a lot it's, of work. It's not fun. It's, it's it's too much work, and we really got it dialed into. It all comes down to time value. So we just keep it very simple. It's not like we have some crazy algorithm or anything going on like that. We just look at it. Okay, for us to make an extra, if we're going to wholesale it, we'll make this. For us to make an extra ten, fifteen, twenty thousand, how much is it going? How much money? Extra money is it going to cost? How much time is it going to cost us? And then for a flip, it's the same thing as we go through each one of those levels. And if it doesn't make sense, then you know Kirk is really the one that's making that ultimate decision. Uh, we talk about it, of course, on every deal, but he's the one that's really, because he's going to be the one that's over the contractors. Right. right. So he's got to figure out, hey, is this really worth our time to be able to do this? And everything comes back to time, value, and money. You really have to put, you know, a price on your time because sometimes people think, oh, I can do this flip and I can make 50000 but from the time you buy it, do it takes you six, months. Three models, six months. You're six, six months, months when you could have just wholesaled it or wholesaled it, make your 15, 20 grand, but you could have used that money to put it into something else and turn that 50 grand into 100 grand. I even look at things different now, man. Like, and this is an exercise we did yesterday. We we pulled out our properties. We think we got 22 on the contract right now. Yeah. And in total, it's $336,000 in assignments. But then I said, okay, I want to close on at least 150 in the next 20 days. Guys, I don't care if you discount this one, discount this one, discount this one, discount this one, because now I'm looking at bulks, like, Hey, just trim down and let's see what the best offer is that we're getting from because we got a price, but I don't necessarily need to milk it anymore to the max amount that I can milk from one property. Right. So we're starting to discount properties based on how much volume we want to for us to hit the bank account the way where everybody eats and makes money because it doesn't hold, make sense to let's say I can do a, a property that um, I can make thirty thousand on it and. Any hard money lender will put money on that because it's a 70% minus repairs and all that. But then I keep getting feedback. Yeah, you know, it's too tight. It's too this. My contractor is more expensive. All right, what's your offer, man? What What is your offer? Well, I'm, mine is 20. So if he's 20 and I'm at 30, I, I'm, of course, I'm going to negotiate. But if that 20 is part of that 300 and it's going to allow me to get 150 quicker, I'm going to go for it. Um, not every single time we're going to try to, you know, squeeze it a little bit. Hey, okay, 25. How about we do 25, you know? Or, uh, but because we have backlog, we can do that. But when it's, that's your one deal, man, that's tough. That's tough because that $5,000 is like, 
that's another deal, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and we do have we do a lot of deals here that are four thousand dollars, you know, three thousand. And but hey, you do ten of those, that's thirty forty grand. Hey, that's not a bad day yeah. for a Matt Buff. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at right now. It's like, how can we keep the pipeline increasing? That way, we're just working on numbers now, as opposed to working on profits per deal. Trying to milk every deal, you it's know. Gotta be a move them. When you have that many deals on the board, you have to. Move you have them, to right? move them, and sometimes we get stuck. Exactly. You know, sometimes we have deals on the board that are four or five months old, right? Yeah. So you're like, but you know, their deals. You just haven't been able to find the <laughs> prince that wants to kiss that frog, you know. So, um, so anyhow, now that you guys decide, you know, what your exit strategy is, like, what is your next move? Like, what are you guys looking to build? In the future, like, what do you guys see yourselves in the next? I don't know, two years. Like you, man. Like us. <laughs> no, yeah, you know, we just want to want to build out the operations to where it's running on its own. Um, once we can do that, then we can focus on you know other initiatives that we have in mind. You know, of course, everybody wants to do the bigger thing, the next big thing, right? You know, multifamily, commercial, things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, our our mind is there, but it's in the now mostly. Right. It's like, what can we do now to build this company to where we can then start focusing on? I love what you just said. The, your mind is your in, in the now. Uh, my mind is in the now. Uh, there's so many different shiny objects in the future. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can be building all kinds of stuff. But I'm like, no, right now, this is what we got. We got to grow this. And and I I um I met a guy not long ago. His mind was so scattered, I didn't want to work with him. He wanted me to coach him. But he wanted to do multifamily, and he wanted to do this other thing, and he wanted to raise money. And he wanted, and I was like, dude, pick one. Pick one and run. And he's like, yeah, but I'm doing this, and I've got all these fires. I said, Don't, then I'm not your guy because you're not going to put in the work that I'm going to tell you that you have to put in. Because let's talk about it, guys. Like, you've had three teams now, right? How much work was to train those three teams and how many disappointments did you have in building the team and then rebuilding the team and rebuilding the team again? Yeah. You know? It's a blow. It's a blow, honestly. Um, especially as entrepreneurs, right? Because I think as entrepreneurs, right, to be an entrepreneur, you do have to be crazy in some, yeah. some way. You have to have a little yeah. bit you gotta have a little bit off in you, right, to be able to do it because it's it's a scary thing to do, right? You you completely have no comfort zone. There is no, com if you're getting comfortable as an entrepreneur, this is not, you're probably, you're, it's just not right, right business for you. Right. And, um, it's hard, right? Especially for me on the sales side, right? So a lot of that time comes for me to be able to train the guys. And I know they'll have questions for, for Kirk as well and he'll assist as well. But, you know, you always have these expectations for people, right? And, and that's how I've been able to minimize my disappointments is to lower my expectations. So my thing is that all I can do is do my very best as a leader to help build other leaders. And whether they take to it and grow, that's on them. But also what, I, what we've also learned from that, too, is making that our onboarding process um, a little bit more um, efficient, right, automated, mm -hmm. so that we're not putting too much work into the trainings and they can go, hey, go watch these videos. We have these videos recorded for you. So that way it feels less draining if they were to leave. Right, they watched the video, it wasn't your time and efforts exactly. into them. Exactly, exactly. And what do you guys do? Do you guys do any self-development? And I know you attend seminars and courses. You're going to be speaking here in our mastermind. We're excited for that. Yeah, for I, can, I can't wait, brother. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. wait. Uh, but per, on a personal level, how the, do you guys have some morning routines, things of that nature that help you keep that entrepreneur mindset straight? How does it look like? If you have any, I don't know. Yeah, I know you exercise. Uh, <laughs> just a little. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, my morning routine um, it may differ. It differs from Lee's, but every morning I wake up around anywhere between four thirty to five five a.m. Have you always been an early? No, no, at all. <laughs> okay. At all. Yeah, I really had to train myself to to get up that early. Wow. Um, for me, I was you know normally seven thirty eight o'clock guy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but um, yeah, I had to train myself to start getting up a lot early because my thing was I was getting up when we first started the business. I was getting up at, you know, seven, eight o'clock, and I'm like, man, 
I don't have enough time to get certain things done during the day. And and it's not things in regards to the business, but more personal matters, right? Things at home, I'm married, right? So, right. You know, taking care of things at home. Yeah, then you, you, you get there late. You get, yeah, right? So it's like, okay, what can I do? Well, I can wake up earlier. Get up earlier. Right, get up earlier. So that's what I started doing. Started getting up earlier. Um, 4.30 so is early, bro. It is. It yeah, is I've, I've done that. I've done that. <laughs> I'm not doing it right now. But it doesn't work for me. Yeah, I've done that. It is, but uh, it's it's refreshing, man, because, you know, a lot of the noise isn't there, right? There's no emails. There's no... You can focus on yourself. You can focus, right? So I get up. I read. I read the Bible early in the morning. I uh, do a little devotional with my wife. Then after that, uh, I get to exercising, right? Get that energy pumping. Uh, so I either go to the gym or I do a cardio exercise at home. And then after that, I'll try to read, uh, read a book. That's good. So that that takes you what three hours? Yeah, just about. Yeah. So you pay yourself three hours. Check this out, guys. That's why these guys are successful. He's paying himself three hours before the day actually starts. Um, which is, I, I used to do that until I would say a few months ago. Um, now my children are going to school, and. I'm enjoying that right now to where we're in bed together, you know, and, and, and my, my son is hugging me and my daughter comes and hugs me. And so I'm, I'm doing, I, I quit that routine more because of that. Uh, but I'm finding other ways to continue to, to stay engaged with the routine, but through different parts of the day. And I'm going to bed earlier. Yeah, so absolutely. what about you? Uh, so very similar. Um, so I've done different routines, reading books, right? The, the, uh, the Miracle Morning is a good yeah. one. I've done that routine as well. But you got to really have to tailor it to what works best for you that you can keep for a long time. So for me, what I've been doing, um, what I've been doing most recently is I'm usually waking up between 6 and 6.45 a.m. And then what I immediately do, I go get a glass of water, get a glass of water, and then I start stretching. So I start doing stretching, yoga. And then what I'm on right now, I haven't really told a lot of people, but uh, I don't even think I've told Kurt, but I'm on day 21, and my goal is to get uh, to have 100 days, uh, 100 days consistent of at least working out for at least 30 minutes a day. Oh wow! No breaks. So even though if, even for the days that I need to kind of heal, recover my muscles, I'll just go walk in the neighborhood. I'll go walk right. two miles, three miles, or whatever, just so I'm doing something. So 30 minutes, 100. I'm going for 100 days straight of just working out for 30 minutes, and that and the reason for that is because. When you have a big goal like that, a big commitment like that, it's helping to remind ourselves that in order for us to help develop leaders and be leaders for other people, you have to first be a leader for yourself. And your own Not only that, man, it yeah. develops consistency, you know. Uh, if you're consistent at doing 100 days of that, then you're going to be consistent in everything else. Absolutely. That's how I developed the consistency on, on, on our marketing. It's because I was consistent on our other things, you know. Sure. And I was like, man, how come our marketing is not going out on time? And I would ask, you know, at the time, then it's like, hey, he's like, well, we don't have money right now or do, you know, whatever the excuse <laughs> was, you know. Right, right. And I was like, dude, we got to do whatever it takes to get this marketing out. And, and then we'll figure a way out to put it out. But now it's like every time an assignment comes in, 30% comes here, goes back into marketing, and that, that thing is running, you know. And, but it's the simple things in life, like doing 100 days straight of exercising, that will get you there. I should I should join that program. By the way, <laughs> it's only thirty uh, minutes. I tell you what, man. I love. I, I I just had COVID like you know a month ago, and I was out for two weeks. Right, I lost fifteen pounds. No way. Yeah, and no exercise because I was locked up in my room. You know, <laughs> but it was because I was only eating once a day, and I wasn't eating a lot of food. I was just eating soups and stuff like that. But then I said, man, I'm gonna piggyback on this momentum, man, and go and push the gym. And so that's what I'm doing right now. So how? How was that experience with uh, with COVID, man? How was that? Man, I think this was the second time I had it. Uh, yeah. Reason why I say this is because in December 2019, uh, before COVID even was on our radar, COVID was still out there, was already out there. That's why it's called COVID-19, because it was created in 2019, and it was released sometime in October. So we had it around, but nobody knew about it. We heard things about China and locking down and this and that. Man, we got sick in the house. Everybody got sick, and it was bad. Like, all the COVID symptoms. Like, I remember I had to ask my wife to give me some, uh, um, like, my son has asthma, so they do, like, 
Breathing uh, treatments. Breathing treatments. Yeah. And I was like, you got to go do a breathing treatment on me because I'm freaking, I can't even breathe. And I was just coughing my lungs out. And then my mother-in-law, this, this is the strongest woman I've ever met in my life. She called me one day. She said, you got to take me to the ER. And for her to say that, I was like, man, she must be freaking dying. So I took her to the ER and they, they diagnosed her with step throat. But she's like, there's no way, man. There's got to be something else. Cause so, so at the time, we got real sick. Then the whole year went around. We went on lockdown. I remember I got on a truck with Dennis and Alex Velasquez. Shout out to Alex. He used to work with us here. And um, Alex had COVID. And Dennis caught it. I didn't caught it. So it's because probably my antibodies were high. Right? I already had it. So... And then I went, I started going on events. I started going to the family reunions, started going to uh, REA coaches in Alabama. I started going everywhere, man. And everywhere I was going, guess where I was going? I was going to bars and, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, there's yeah. COVID has to be in the air. And I never caught it. So my, fr my father was like, dude, you must have some immune stuff on your system. I said, no, that I think I got it in December and I have antibodies. So the second time around, um, now that I got it, um, a, a month ago, it was very mild. Now, it did put me to bed for a couple of days, like, but it was, I was just tired. I couldn't get up. I just wanted to sleep. And then I went to a little clinic here. They shot me with B12. I sweat like, I never sweat before like that. Like, I, my, and this is what I'm, what I'm sleeping throughout the night. My 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 shirt and my shorts were soaking wet. Like if I would have done a full day marathon, that's how I was. When you woke up, yeah, oh, wow. and I was like, well, actually, I woke up a few times during the night, and I was like, what is this, man? I never sweat like this in my life. And it was that B twelve shot. Uh, they also shot me with some antibiotics, and then like five days later, I was good to go. Jeez, good to go, and I felt like a like a champ. Now I was a little slow for another week. Like, I came here, and I would sit down in my computer and go through emails, but I was not, you know, 100%. I was very slow. But luckily, man, um, I didn't get the pneumonia or anything like that, like our friend Thomas did, and he's carrying bottles, you know, and I feel I feel bad because, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, that takes years to recover, right? And we've lost a people as well that passed away because of that. Um, so that was my experience with it, and... So here we are. And, you know, the beautiful thing is while I was through COVID, these guys were closing deals. Awesome. So, man, my peace of mind was like, because imagine if you are on your own rat race and it depends on you to answer the phone or it depends on you on selling the property and you get COVID, that's it. Your business just stopped for, for a month. That's right. And then while you're trying to get back re-engaged, that's another month. And then he can set you back 90 days, you know, so it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. So that's why we, I believe on having multiple dispos and multiple acquisitions. That way, they, you know, if some one of them gets sick or whatnot, then we still have a couple to rely on. Um, but for that, you got to have the volume. Uh, if, if we don't have volume, then it makes no sense to have a bunch of people sitting around <laughs> watching motivational videos all day, you know. So to wrap up, do you guys do anything special in your office to build your culture? Like, what is it that you guys as leaders are, are doing to keep your guys pumped up and, and maybe trainings or, or be, like we watch here uh, a show called The Selection. And this is Navy SEALs training uh, civilians uh, into, like, the Navy SEAL training pretty much. So they grab these people off the streets, they put them in there, and they grab 30, and at the end, they only four of them graduate, which is kind of like the ratio for, for Navy SEAL training. And then what we do is we, we analyze every episode, and we say, okay, what did we learn from this episode? And, like, they're, on the second episode, I remember they carry a log. Like, you know, they do the log exercise, but this thing is huge and it's heavy as hell. So every time somebody doesn't pick up on a lead, I say, man, you're slacking off on the log. Direct, you know, a direct connection there. I was like, ah, oh, shit, that's the video we watch. So that, that's what we do here every Monday. We do it, and then we do our morning, our Monday meeting. What do you guys do? How is your, like, 
process? Yeah, so uh, very similar schedule, right? So on our Mondays, we actually have a team meeting, obviously with Kirk being in dispo, myself being in acquisitions and our guys. So on Mondays is we, we start off. We, so we start off Monday through Friday. We start off all our meetings with gratitude. It just keeps us all just connected, right? Just what we're thankful for, right? Monday, so Monday through Thursday, we start off just with gratitude. Just what are you thankful for? Whether it's the business, whether it's your personal life, and we just share those stories with each other. And then on Fridays, what we also do is at the end of the week, we just share gratitude. Of what are we thankful for for each other, right? For the team specifically. Right? That's awesome. What are, what are you thankful for, um, you know, for each other, right? And, we, and just it, those little small things of gratitude go so much in, in really, I think, building that culture of that family that we're really trying to build. And uh, one of the other things is on that Monday, on that Monday, we watch a motivational video. So uh, one of my favorites is obviously E.T., e. the hip-hop preacher. Oh, man, he's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah, and uh, Goggins. David Goggins. David Goggins, so he's a Navy SEAL as well. So Yeah. Um, and then we'll have them just, you know, we'll let them pick, hey, what video you want to watch, right? You guys pick out a video for Monday, and that's what we're going to watch. And very similar thing, like, what, what, what did you take away? And we all go around it, so... Uh, Kirk and I included, right? We're, we're all we're all on the same page, right? Do you guys have an agenda? Like, do you go through an agenda of your morning meetings and all that? Yeah, yes. Okay. So everybody, it's it's consistency, right? right? And that's what you have to provide when you're building a business, right? Because we've had these conversations in masterminds that we have. And it's like, as entrepreneurs, we sometimes we don't really need, uh, you, you know, as much structure. The structure, yeah. When you're building a team and you're bringing people on, you have to provide that. Structure. All the meetings need to be the same. And you got to analyze your numbers and your KPIs. So one thing we do is on that video, on our agenda, that's what, how we started. Right. So, hey, what do you learn from, you know, whatever episode? Oh, I learned this. I learned that. And everybody starts. And we write it down on the agenda. So the following week, before we start writing down on the agenda, we go over what we learned on the last week. So we keep it fresh. Uh, so we go, hey, we learn, you know, yeah, you got to keep pushing forward. You, you can't give up. You, you got to be a team player. Uh, or sometimes you got to be a solo player, you know, like make things happen on your own. So, and what's been the feedback from from your team? They love they it. Love it. Yeah, they love it. They love it. We we're gonna finish this election in this Monday. We're, we're, we'll be done with that. So I think next time, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start playing um, the Hall of Fame inductions uh, to NBA players because you know they do like a 20, 30 minute speech. So we're probably going to start. Wa- I've been watching it all weekend, actually. Dude, my wife is like, why are you watching all these Hall of Fame inductions? <laughs> and I said, because it's, 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 it inspires me. You know, these guys, a lot of them, they, like I watch Dennis Rodman. I mean, I understand now why he is the way he is. Yeah. You know, no father. You know, uh, his mom kicked him out, you know, when he was 18. And and then you're like, okay, now I understand why he's trying to grab so much attention. is because he had a void, you know. But he said that in the in the in the speech, and then he was grateful about it, and he thanked his mom for being like the way she was, and and then uh, Ray Allen, you know, he spoke about you know, and then you you see the guys like Michael Jordan and or 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 Scotty Pippen, and so there is a lot to learn from those speeches, you know, which is, hey, yeah, those guys are ultra successful today. Because they made a lot of money in the NBA, but they weren't always like that, you know. I mean, Michael Jordan got kicked out of his team, That's right. you know, or not kicked out, but he wasn't accepted to the, right. to the varsity <laughs> team or whatever, you know. And that was his motivation to go be better at it, right? Um, so I think that's what we're going to start, not next week, but the following week. We're going to start watching the, the Hall of Fame. In the, they don't know yet. Uh, so... Uh, see, I see it out to you see how oh yeah yeah, yeah. They, 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 I, I, it's, it's different so i, I want to try it out you know and see how that you know gets them going and another thing we do is we have um on our on our crm we have a space for self-development so and they have to click what they did like i re- so we put 10 things that you can do on a daily basis for self-development they only have to click on three whether you read 10 pages of a book or you watch the motivational video on your own or you listen to a podcast or whatever else, you know, you went to church. I don't know. We got different things in there. And every day they go and click them. And and based on that, we keep accountability. Like, hey, man, what happened to you? You didn't watch your video yesterday. You know, like, oh, man, I forgot or whatever. We'll get back on it, right? So just being accountable about um, because we know that we all need to work on ourselves. 100%. All of us. 
you know, I guarantee you all those ultra, su ultra successful people, they're still working on themselves, you know, because your business can be perfect. I mean, you rebuild your team three times and it probably was going well and then it didn't go well. And, you know, but it's that mindset that keeps you going. So anyhow, guys, October 21st through the 24th, you want to come meet Lee and Kirk. They got a seven figure business out of the Houston area, which is very tough to do, by the way. It's easier to do it nationwide. These guys are very uh, localized in not only Houston, but they just open up Dallas. They're going to be opening up San Antonio pretty soon. Yes, and, um, guys, you guys want to come meet uh, uh, Lee and Kirk. They're going to be speaking on stage on how they do business, what they do. They're going to be uncovering a lot of their secrets and whatnot. And this is October 21st to the 24th, re3mastermind.com. You definitely want to check the website, get your tickets ASAP. Uh, and I'm looking forward to see you there. Guys, thank you so much for coming in. And I can't wait until uh, we do this event together again. Absolutely. We're, we're excited. Peace. Peace guys.